discuss the background of safety. Okay, so everybody should know that when you're working in a lab, or you're working at a hospital, or you're working, at, I don't know, any place, you have the right to know what dangers are in your environment, right? You have a right to know the chemicals or the reagents you're using and how they might be, how they might be danger to you, right? And part of that is that we have a hazardous communication program at ACC. Now, every place I've ever worked at has a hazardous communication uh, program, right? And so I worked for J&J, I worked for Abbott, I worked for Hospira, I worked for AOK Abeo, I've worked for uh, Spawn Hospital in Corpus Christi, Texas. I've done a lot, right? I worked for Texas State, so I've done a lot. But the three elements for hazardous communication are the communication from your instructor, because we're in an academic setting. But it could be a communication from a team leader. It could be a communication from your boss, OK? Safety data sheet. It used to be called material safety data sheet. But these are, these are pieces of information that, by law, we have to have in the lab. Right, but there, everything is everything is online these days. So, if someday I come in and say, today we're going to be working with cinnamon cinnamon aldehyde, and and I say, and it's not dangerous to you. It might be a little bit irritating if you get it on your skin or your eye. Be sure that you weigh your safe, your personal protective equipment, right? But you open it up and it and the smell bothers you, so your eyes start to water, and you're like, I don't really believe that Pro V guy. You have the right to look that up right then and there or go over to the area where our safety data sheets are and look up that reagent to see what the potential hazards are, okay? And then the hazard labels. And so the hazard labels are come in three different forms, right? So those three different forms they come in, they can be a bar label, they can be a diamond label, or they can be a globally harmonized label, right? So people are trying to go to these globally harmonized, harmonized, harmonized la uh, labels because that way people who don't speak the language that might be spoken in that particular facility or in that particular country, everybody's on the same, everybody's on the same page, right? I like a combination of the two. Right, either the bar label, the bar and diamond label, one of those, and then a global, globally harmonized label. Okay, there's a lot of them, and I'm not going to expect you to know all of them, but I'll show you which ones I want you to know. Anybody have any questions so far? Be sure you know what a hazardous communication pro program is and the three elements. Okay, so you'll need to wear eyewear. And so you'll need to purchase safety glasses if you haven't already. Uh, and they need to be rated Z87. So you cannot just bring in any pair of safety glasses like you might use it on skiing trips and things like that, and, and they'll be acceptable. You have to have them so that the goggles or the glasses are rated Z87. So uh, you can buy them at the bookstore, but they'll be a premium. Um, probably cost you 15 bucks. I would prefer that you go to Walmart or Home Depot or <clears throat> or Lowe's and buy them, right? There are lots of different styles, but you need them to have side shields and you need them to be rated Z87. Now, how do you know that? Well, these are mine and these are what safety glasses look like. You can see they have side shields, but also on the edge of the of this particular handle, you'll see that it says Z87. And that's what's important, OK? So I need you to purchase a pair of safety glasses or goggles um, for our first time that we're in lab, which will be on the 2nd of February, OK? Any questions? Okay, so if you wear glasses or you wear contacts, you have to wear the glasses or the goggles overwards. I will tell you that the goggles can get kind of warm, so glasses are almost always better. And you can get glasses that will fit over most eyeglasses. 
you can get safety glasses that will fit over most eyeglasses, right? So you just go to those different stores and you pick one that's going to work best for you. Okay. Any questions? Other things you'll need to wear is you'll need to wear gloves uh, anytime we're working in the lab. Uh, on, 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 unless we work with just the microscope, which is lab four, you won't have to wear gloves that day. Um, but any other time when we're working with diluents or solutions or solvents, you'll need to wear gloves. And we'll wear night tower gloves. You'll have to wear shoes that will protect your entire foot. So you need to have shoes that cover your toes and your heel. Okay. And that's it. If you want to, if you, we do have aprons in the 1406 lab. That if you want to wear them, you can. Not required. Um, or if you want to buy a lab coat and wear a lab coat, then you can do that but it's not required, okay? So this is what an individual would look like if they work in my micro lab, right? So you can see they have safety goggles um, right here or glasses. They have a lab coat or an apron, right? Not required in 1406, but required in microbiology. They have gloves and our gloves will be nitrile. They have long pants. I'm okay if you wear shorts, but if you wear shorts and you have to wear an apron on top of them, okay? And then you can see that the shoes will be so that it protects the entire foot. Okay. The other thing you'll have to do is if your hair is longer, you'll have to be able to put it back so that it's tied back away from your face and it will not fall uh, into uh, an experiment when you're working in the lab. Okay. So be sure you have a, a hair tie or a, a barrette or whatever it needs, whatever it is that you will wear your hair back with. Okay, good. Anybody have any questions? Lab hygiene. So we're going to be working with diluents and we're going to be working with, with uh, chemicals and powders, right? So anytime you use them, be sure that you put the lid back on them, right? That's for lots of reasons. Number one, people won't pick them up by the lid and drop them. Somebody might not get contaminated with them. And if we're working with uh, an irritant, then you want to be sure that that irritant's not going to affect somebody who's working next to you. Okay. If you get when we work um, when we work with um, with dilutions, we're going to be working with potassium permanganate. That stuff is really light, and it's purple, and it goes everywhere. But if you get more than you need, you do not put it back into the container. You just simply throw it away. Okay. Dispose of chemicals or waste as instructed by me or by our lab technician. His name is Keith Crippen, and uh, he'll be in the lab with us, and he'll direct you, or I'll direct you for where you need to put the waste. Okay. Turn off equipment as instructed. So we're not going to be using flames in 1406, but we'll be using a lot of electrical devices. We'll be using heat blocks. We'll be using balances. We'll be using um, thermocyclers, everything you can think about we're going to be using. So um, you want to be sure that you turn those off and, or electrophoresis devices. You'll be sure that you turn those off when you're not using them, right? Wash your hands when you come into the lab. Now it's going to be different for us because we're going to be there for lecture, right? And you might be having coffee and lecture because we're not in lab yet. And then all of a sudden at three o'clock, that room becomes a lab room and now you can't have coffee, you can't have Cokes, you can't have anything. So you got to take all that stuff out, right? So be sure you be sure you follow the rules. Then you want to assume that everything that you come in contact with is corrosive and possibly irritative. And so if you think about that, that leads us to the concept of universal precautions. Now universal precautions is usually done in the medical world and the idea is that everything you come in contact that can be patient derived could be potential, potentially hazard to you because it's infectious. So we're not using infectious agent and we're not going to handle any tissues or any kind of avoidant substances from the human body. But we should still consider everything that we are working with as potentially hazardous. If somebody cuts themselves in the lab, then that is a potential for a bloodborne pathogen. So I will be dealing with that. Okay, if you want to know how to clean that up, 
if that happens in the lab, you guys can watch, but you guys are not to clean up any type of, of vomitus or, or blood that might happen in the lab. I will take care of that. Okay. All right. Getting back to hazardous communication, that's two times, three times I brought it up, right? It's going to be important. You'll see it again. But uh, you'll see that on, everything that's in our lab is going to be labeled with these hazards of communication label. I will tell you of things that we're using that are potentially dangerous before we start lab. I kind of have like a little huddle period where the whole group gets together, the whole lab gets together, and we talk about what those hazards are and what, what, what the pitfalls might be. Okay, um, but the important thing to remember is that there are two different uh, categories by which, which by which hazards are being communicated to you. The first one is the category of the hazard. So that's by color. So blue is for health or toxicity, red is for flammability, yellow is for reactivity, and white is for a special hazard or it sometimes might say you need to wear this this particular type of PPE. PPE is personal protective equipment, okay? And then a number that will communicate the level of the hazard, right? And so if we think about the level of a hazard, then um, you might consider what that means, right? And so the level of the hazard, if you think about it, right? Zero is minimal, one is slight, two is moderate, three is severe, and four is extreme hazard, okay? So that covers the hazard of communication of the bar label and the diamond label. The other, uh, other, the other labels I wanna show you are the globally harmonized labels. And there's a few of them I want you to know. So I want you to know the biohazard, the biohazard one, we're not gonna, we're not going to be working with bacteria every day, but when we when we work with microscopes, I'm going to go over to the micro lab and I'm going to bring some bacteria over. And so you're going to be working with bacteria that particular, these will be live organisms, right? So I want you to know that. You do not need to know ra radioactivity. The others that I want you to know are, I want you to know um, the poison, skull and crossbones, flammability, and I want you to know health hazard. Those are the only four I want you to know, right? They could be on a practical, okay? There's some other things that are important on here for me, right? Protect the environment is hugely important to me, but I will do that, right? You're, you aren't going to have to do anything special. I will have systems in place so that we protect the environment, okay? All right, so the last topic I wanna to talk to you about is packaging. And so this is containers that will hold reagents or in some cases, active drug priority. So what I wanna let you know is the container that is holding the substance is a primary container, right? That container can be put into another container to protect that particular substance from handling or whatever. Okay, that's called a secondary container. So here, if you look at this particular uh, images that are on here, this is a blister pack that might have things like, I don't know, Benadryl. And so the blister pack you can see has the Benadryl in it, right? But then the Benadryl, the, that blister pack is put into a carton and the carton is protecting those blister packs from being damaged or coming in contact with people who shouldn't come in contact with them. That's a secondary container. Okay. Tertiary containers are almost always going to be corrugate. They're going to be cardboard and they're used to transfer materials from one place to another. Okay. So if we look at this, this could be a secondary container because inside of it might be these other four containers that are primary containers. So can you see the differentiation of what I'm trying to tell you? Right. So somebody tell me again what a primary container does. What does a primary container do? Protects the direct interaction with the product that's That contained. is good. That is perfect. Very good. What does a secondary container do?
What does a secondary container do? It protects the primary container, right? It's that second level of containment. And somebody tell me <coughs> what the application of a tertiary container is. What does a, what's a tertiary container used for? For shipping and bulk handling. Correct, Amundo. Just like that. Moving from one place to another. Okay. Now you might think, Proveen, uh, why do we need to know this? Well, because every place I've ever worked at, including ACC, deals with all these containers. And I want people to understand that these are important, right? I, I'm not just saying this just to, you know, make it confusing so that I can have another question on the practice. I want you all to know this, okay? So as we end today's meeting, um, I want you to have a great experience. I want you to follow the rules. Remember, this is the background. We're going to do in-person safety training on the second when we meet together for the first time, okay? And so when that happens, um, we will we will be working together and I will make sure that you understand where everything's at, right? So we can be as safe as possible. Is there, are there any 